Do you know that most people let go four to six weeks in on New Year's resolutions? Let's be resolute, resolute resolved, resolute. <laughs> Let's be resolute and resolved uh, in our lives to be people that are of the word, prayer warriors, uh, and that we'll be people of generosity and serving and that we will have really good community and be in unity one with, with another. I want to share something because we talked about, wouldn't it be great to have testimonies come forward out of our 21 days of prayer? And, uh, and we came together one level below this level on a Wednesday night. Many of you were there. We were about 70 strong. And we prayed together together. And that was the closing out, the week that we were closing out the 21 days of prayer. We had little stations that were there writing out our prayers, and we also had a service from the front, meaning that there were those that would get up, take a microphone, and lead us in prayer over a specific area that we were praying about. The prayer area that was given to me that night was leaders, Government leaders, international, uh, U.S., uh, state leaders, local leaders. And so I prayed a prayer before my prayer. And the prayer that I prayed before my prayer was, God, I will pray over leaders, but I pray that there will be something very unique that happens. I pray that not only will we pray for leaders, but you will give us opportunities to meet the leaders and to speak forth an encouragement of faith into their lives. And I pray that for the whole church. Then I got up and I prayed for leaders. Within 48 hours, something happened. And I want to encourage you by this because I believe that God answers our prayers. We don't just loft them into space and and then let them go and move on to the next thing. God answers prayer. Jesus said, my church shall be a house of prayer. And God is interactive in our lives to answer our prayers in the now and in miraculous ways. So within 48 hours, I got a text that I wasn't expecting. And it came from a good friend of mine who's a congressman out of Texas by the name of Michael Cloud. Back in the early days, uh, Michael was a student when I was chaplain at ORU. And then he went out to work at a church in, um, in Texas in Victoria, Texas, and he would be the one to pick me up at the airport and that would take me back when I would speak at that church. And so he was always really good about doing that and stopping off at the beef jerky place that I always liked. In Texas, you can get jerky of every kind. It's not just beef jerky. You can get chicken jerky. You can get turkey jerky. You can buy it by the pound, two pounds, five pounds, whatever you feel you need. And it's a special place where you can get jerky. And he would take me to get the jerky. And there's stories about all that. But to focus in on the story here... I gave him a gift for being the one who was always uh, so kind as to come out and pick me up and drop me off and all the rest. And I gave him a portfolio, and that leather portfolio uh, had the embossed seal of the President of the United States on the cover. And I was coming to share the vision of what was happening in our nation's uh, capital and in the D.C. metro area with the church. And I gave that to him, and I said, this will remind you to pray over our leaders And he reminded me of that the night that we were praying over him as he became a United States member of Congress. And he said there was a time where he brought his family on a vacation to D.C. He was in the gallery of the House of Representatives. He was looking down at all of the members of Congress as they were coming in and out for a vote. And he felt an impression on his heart that God was speaking to him that One day he's going to be down there and he'll be one of the ones that is doing what he's watching. Now he he just held that in his heart. What does that mean? He just held it there. When he ran for Congress, he ran against somebody who was uh, uh, an incumbent who had been there for so many terms. I don't know that anybody thought Michael had a chance. He won the election. Now I believe in his fourth term. Okay, back to the story. So I get a text from Michael and he says, Bill, would you be able to join me at a members only national prayer breakfast uh, on Friday or thir- well, no, Thursday, maybe it was. And I, uh, I thought, well, maybe he's a bit confused. 
Because the National Prayer Breakfast that we have been to in the past, and the last time we went was under the Obama administration, is over at the Hilton Hotel. That's where Ronald Reagan was shot, in front of that hotel. I always remember that, although no, I don't know that others are really thinking about it as they're going in for prayer. But a lot of history at that place, and thousands come, and you don't know if you're even going to get in the main building or main part of the building where the breakfast is. You may be in the overflow, but the president comes and speaks each year. And I thought, wait, this one's on the hill. He says members only, and he has one ticket for it, and would I accept it? So I thought that maybe that was for some members of Congress, and we'd have a small group of, of uh, congressional leaders and, and others, um, a few others that have been invited. Well, immediately I said yes. Now, listen to this. It may change your life. Lisa and I talked years ago about invitations, And that when an invitation comes, we need to be in prayer about that invitation. Don't just treat it as, oh, we were invited to something. I don't know. We're busy. But instead, pray, God, is this an open door whereby you want us to walk through that door? And so we became very different about invitations. We became very sensitive to the word invitation, and you are invited, those words. And so with this, I didn't think to be too busy I just said, yes, Michael, I'm there. I'll, I'll meet you uh, in the morning at your office. So I went there, got lost in the Cannon Building, and then Michael met with me and took me where we were going to go. And it was a long table, and it had pastries, and it had fruit on the table and coffee and orange juice. So as we're getting those things, Michael said, do you want to go in the main auditorium when we're done with uh, coffee, or do you want to greet people as they come in? Well, at that point, I realized that the ones that were walking by me were not only members of the House, but members of the Senate because I had been praying for them. And here came Senator Rick Scott, and there's Senator Klobuchar, and there's Senator Marsha Blackburn. And, and I'm seeing them go by. Michael is over here. The, the people are talking to him. He just got placed on three subcommittees for uh, appropriations, which is a big deal. And they're coming up and talking to him about appropriations. I'm there with my orange juice. And I turn around and don't expect it, but two feet from me is the brand new senator, first woman to be elected as United States senator in Alabama, Katie Britt. And I hadn't prepared what I was going to say. And you know how those moments are. Anything can come out of your mouth. And the first words out of my mouth as I turned around, saw her, she's looking at me, she's expecting me to say something. And I looked at her and I said, oh, I've been praying for you. And she threw her arms around me and then stepped back and said very emphatically, she said, you have no idea how much that means to me right now. I said, well, you know God's hand rests on you and you have faith in your heart. And here you are that God has placed you as a United States senator and you are not alone in regard to faith. You've got a lot of people praying for you. You know, at that moment, I realized that the things that I had prayed for just like 48 hours earlier were coming true right before my eyes. Then I got back after, well, I'll tell you just a little bit more. We went into the auditorium in about 200 uh, seating at the base, about 100 above, and so about 300 in all, and I'm looking, and there's Senator Bill Nelson, the astronaut of one of the space shuttles, and uh, out of Florida, And he had uh, visited our church as his son and daughter were in our church for a matter of time, especially the son was here for a couple of years. And, uh, and Lisa went to a, uh, a retreat with Grace Nelson, the wife. So I remembered him, and now he's over all of NASA. And there he is seated over here. And then I see there's Senator Mark Pryor. And he was in our church for several years And he was uh, the senator from Arkansas. And I'm looking at my phone and trying to figure out, so is there a prayer, national prayer breakfast over at the Hilton and also here on Capitol Hill? And what is happening? And I'm reading that things have changed and now there's a committee or a board that is in charge of the members only, uh, with one invite uh, each, members only prayer meeting on the hill, and the person that's the chairman of the board is Senator Mark Pryor, and he used to be in our church. 
And I thought, God, this is really amazing to see all this and what you're doing. And then in walked the president of the United States. And he walked in and the vice president walked in and the former speaker of the house walked in and the current speaker of the house that I stayed up past midnight to watch him finally get elected walked in. And you see all of these people, Democrat, and Republican, coming together. <clears throat> and it was an amazing moment. Then we went to Michael's office afterwards. Michael had to go to another breakfast. I don't know how he stays slim <laughs> as he goes to all these breakfasts. And he leaves me in his office and kind of locks me in there. So I'm in his office and I notice that I missed something. And it was a phone call from a person that I don't know, but who was linked to me by a mutual friend. And the mutual friend was doing a leadership seminar for Disney and met the two, two that were uh, leaders, top leaders in the National Day of Prayer. That's different than the National Prayer Breakfast. Now he's reaching out to me, and this is on the same day that the two biggest prayer things happening in our nation are coming right to my front door. So I responded back, and he said that Rebecca Contreras, who used to work for George W. Bush and was in charge of all of his boards and commissions, told me about you and your wife, Lisa, and all that is happening in D.C. and your church, and I believe that your church needs to be a vital part of what we're doing with the National Day of Prayer. And he began to tell about his life, and I shared about mine. It was as, as if we were two long-lost brothers. Almost everything he had done in his life, I had done, or vice versa. It was, it was as if we were twins. I felt like I was making a good friend. All of that, immediately after that prayer, was right in the center of my life. Now, that means it's in the center of yours, too. We started out here as a prayer center. We were the largest contingent for the National Day of Prayer of anybody that was in their meetings on Capitol Hill. We would look at each other, Capitol Life Church, Capitol Life Church, Capitol Life Church, Capitol Life Church. We were all over the place. They'd name anything that was a national prayer movement, if it was on the steps of the Capitol, in the Capitol, uh, whatever it was, a prayer walk, we would be there. And I believe that God is calling us to that central place again to make a profound difference because our leaders are dropped off in the D.C. area and then their family says, bye, we're going back to the easy to live in state we're from. And you get to stay in Washington, D.C. and get to know people. And these people need to know that we're praying for them, right? So let's continue to pray for our leaders. Let me speak today on the topic, Jesus' team. It is a series, and I believe it goes well right now with entering into these life groups, small groups that we at Capital Life call life groups, and that you can jump into a life group, and you can get to uh, know people at church, walk with people who are like-hearted and like-minded, and make the best friends of your life. And so I want you to continue to do that as we move through the coming days and weeks. In Acts 17, the Bible calls Jesus' team, quote, those who turned the world upside down. In Revelation 21, the Bible states that the 12 foundations of the wall of the new Jerusalem, speaking of the future, will have their names, the disciples' names on them. Matthew 19 tells us that the disciples will sit on 12 thrones in the hereafter. They were chosen by Jesus. They would spend little more than 18 months being trained to launch and lead the early church. They were 12 in number, we know that, and we know them as the disciples or the apostles. So I want to talk about Jesus' team. Because we all need a team of people we're going through life with, right? And we want to make certain that we have the right team. I know Dave Ramsey was talking along the lines of finances, so please take this beyond solely finances because it's true, I think, across life. He said, your friends, if you look at your friendship group, you are financially making within 10% of your friendship group. Now, that's an interesting thought. It may not be true of every friend, but he was basically saying those you run with in life, those are the ones that you're going to be like. And for Jesus, who is God himself, 
to get together 12 people. I want to know a little bit more about the 12. It might help me know what type of people I need to focus in on and come closer to and, be, and that they would be a part of my group of friends and close core group. Again, they were chosen by Jesus. Now, let's look at Mark 1, 17. Jesus says, come follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. He's speaking to these disciples. Now, that word, those words, follow me, are an invitation. And I just spoke to the power of an invitation. Jesus is inviting them to step into a greater depth of intimacy with God and to experience a greater realm of influence. Let's look at Matthew in the 10th chapter, starting with the second verse. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So why 12? Have you ever thought of that? Why would Jesus have a core group of 12 or a close circle of 12 friends? They, this is connected to the Old Testament 12 tribes of Israel. So that's why we see 12. Why these 12? Now there's not really any extraordinary thing about the 12. And in a way, I like that because there are moments where we might think, well, oh, the 12 disciples of Jesus, put them in stained glass, untouchable, can't identify. But the reality is, is that God is no respecter of persons. That means that God sees your faith the same way he saw the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That God sees in you the same thing he could have seen in Esther or in the apostles or in the apostle Paul. All of these individuals we could think are so far beyond us. But the reality is they're flesh and blood individuals and God will interact in our lives in powerful ways if we also will lean into God and place our faith there. Can I hear an amen from you on that? So... These individuals were ordinary. There are no scholars, no intellectuals amongst them. Uh, We don't see rabbis. We don't see Sadducees. We don't see Pharisees. We see no nobility or royalty within the group. They were prone to mistakes. They had wrong attitudes at times. They had doubts at times. They were far from the obvious choices of who you would think God would choose to be his team of 12. Let's read something in 1 Corinthians that I think really gives us all hope that we can be greatly used by God. And I believe you can be. And I believe we launched the year saying, let's be people of the word of God. Let's speak the word over our lives. Let's believe the word fully. Let's be people of prayer. Let's pray prayers beyond praying over our meals. God bless me prayers. But let's pray prayers that shake nations Let's pray prayers that cause healing to go forth and deliverance and and miracles to go forth. Listen to this. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. And again, to me, I take great hope in that, that God can use me. And I take great hope. Hope in the fact that God can use each and every one of us. Because in the long run, we'll lose our titles. In the long run, we'll lose our job descriptions. The things that we're so busy about and feel pressured by right now won't be there anymore. And what we'll want to know is that we live fully the calling that was upon our lives. Amen? Amen. I want to read something to you that I I read that I thought kind of put all of this in perspective. It's something that somebody wrote. This is not out of scripture, but it is something that I thought 
helps us think on this a little bit more. And it is to Jesus, son of Joseph, woodcrafters, carpenter shop, Nazareth. And it is from the Jordan Management Consultants. Dear sir, thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men you have picked for managerial positions in your new organization. All of them have now taken our battery of tests, and we have not only run the results through our computer, but also arranged personal interviews for each of them. And our psychologist and vocational aptitude consultant have met with them. The profiles of all the tests are included, and you will want to study each one of them carefully. As part of our service, we make some general comments for your guidance, such as an auditor will, will include some general statements. This is given as a result of staff consultation and comes without any additional fee. Long buildup. Okay, focus in. Here we go. It is the staff. It is the staff opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, education, and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise you are undertaking. They do not have the team concept. We would recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience in managerial ability and proven capability. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, place personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale. We feel that it is our duty to tell you that Matthew uh, had been uh, blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. James... The son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus definitely have radical leanings. And they both registered a high score on the manic depressive scale. One of the candidates, however, shows great potential. He is a man of ability and resourcefulness, meets people well, and has a keen business mind and has contacts in high places. He is highly motivated, ambitious, and responsible, We recommend Judas Iscariot as your controller and right-hand man. All of the other profiles are self-explanatory. We wish you every success in your new venture. Sincerely, Jordan Management Consultants. So it gives you a little bit of an idea. I remember when I was asked, and it was after Lisa had been asked two years earlier, Lisa had been asked by Rebecca Contreras, who I mentioned a moment ago, if she would come and lead a Bible study in Rebecca's office. Rebecca, again, was at the time putting together the boards and commissions for then-President George W. Bush. Lisa said, I've never done a Bible study like what you're talking about before. I've studied the Bible, but haven't done that type of thing before. Rebecca said, it may only be you and, uh, you and me, but come. After that people began to come in and the women began that served the president began to find out about this Bible study and they came to it. I remember going on what was uh, a West Wing tour after hours. We made it a prayer walk. And when we went to the Oval Office, Lisa was talking to me and women were ducking their heads out of offices in the West Wing saying, Lisa, I thought that was you. And there were people that were in her Bible study. I realized that what was happening was something that we didn't do anything to set up. It was an open door from God. And to this day, there are still good friends that came out of that Bible study. And it really impacted their time when they felt alone in this area. Two years later, the deputy head of the faith-based office for the president asked me if I would do a similar Bible study and do that Bible study uh, for men. And I was glad to do it and came in and and did that at the time uh, for the band. I don't know why I'm sharing that story. It had something to do with a point I wanted to make. But it was awesome. (laughs) Oh, I remember. So the deputy head of the faith-based office, we were coming back from the second or third time of doing this Bible study. and, And the men in the Bible study were... Uh, were fascinating people, their backgrounds and why they were there and what they were doing. And David Quo, who was in our church, 
and had asked me to do this study, said, Bill, I don't think in my thoughts of, of having a Bible study like this that I would have thought to invite you to lead it. Thank you. <laughs> he said, I probably would have thought somebody at the White House, somebody with this big lofty title or whatever else, he said, you're my pastor, and I couldn't imagine that it could go any better than how it's going, but it wouldn't have been the way I would have normally thought to put it together. At least four of the disciples, perhaps as many as seven, were fishermen. There was a tax collector. There was a religious zealot. All left their livelihoods to follow Jesus. They experienced Jesus 24-7. In other words, they walked with God 24-7. They listened to his teachings. They witnessed his healings. They saw his miracles. And into their hands, Jesus would place the future of the church. And we've all benefited from it. To study the disciples is to study Jesus. And with whom did he choose to associate and confide? To study the disciples is to better understand their mission and our mission, as we study the disciples over the coming Sundays, I want you to ask the question, with which disciple do you most identify, or disciples, do you most identify, and why? And what is it about these disciples that Jesus saw and that I need to look for in my friends, perhaps to nurture in them, perhaps to open up and say, I don't know everything, and I need that in my life, that input of that individual. As we study the disciples, I want you to consider the definition of a disciple, and you are a disciple if you've received Jesus as Savior and you walk with him as being your Lord. A disciple, going back to the Greek meaning of the term, is a learner, student, follower, an adherent to the teacher's Teachings. Now, another word used for these 12 individuals is the word apostle. And going back to the Greek use of that word, it means messenger, sent one, an ambassador fully authorized to be a representative of the sender. So, Jesus taught them a number of things. Do, does anyone remember a few weeks back, I said, there's one thing the disciples asked Jesus to teach them. What was that one thing? How to pray. Prayer. And so Jesus taught them how to pray. He taught them how to forgive. Do you remember that Jesus washed their feet? He was teaching them how to serve. And this is why I believe that there needs to be within us this reminder to be people of prayer, to be people who forgive and release to be people who serve and serve with generosity, with great patience, and sometimes with a, a loving rebuke. Jesus molded these individuals, and Jesus sent them out with great authority. And I want that word to resonate within you. Jesus sent them out with great authority to do what? To add to the church, to heal those that needed healing physically, emotionally to deliver individuals who found themselves bound in their lives. In keeping with the theme of Pastor Julie's message from last Sunday, let me share a few thoughts about and a uh, reminder and maybe just from a slightly different angle of the things she shared with us that will enhance what she, what she was sharing so we'll remember it again. Number one, Jesus addressed the multitudes, remember? That, that vast multitude of people and they would come to him because they knew that something special was happening. This person, Jesus, was causing people to be whole and healed and to be loved by God because he was God. So the multitudes are those who pass through your life and they can be seasonal. Remember that idea here that the average lifespan of a close relationship is seven years according to statistics. And so it might be a seasonal thing, and especially with those that are the multitudes that we don't know that well. Number two, Jesus mobilized the 72. Luke 10, verse 1. These are those we know, but we don't spend as much time with. And then Jesus trained the 12. 
And that was a lot more specific. It's more than being in proximity to Jesus. It's being trained by him. And this is the circle of friends with whom you invest great time. And then number four, Jesus confided in the three. And I don't know how many you feel in life you really confide in. But that's a very, very special stage. And we know that within the three closest friends of Jesus as he walked the face of this earth was Peter. And I want to speak about Peter for just a moment with each of you because we're challenged by this idea to focus in on those with whom we go through life, to be meaningful, proactive, intentional until we're doing all that God has placed within relationships to grow in the Lord and to be effective for Lord Jesus Christ. So within the closest three is Peter. We know more about Peter than any of the rest of the 12. Each time the disciples are listed, guess who's listed first? Peter. Guess who's listed last? Judas. You already were in the first service. You know that. Jesus, uh, Jesus named Peter Cephas, meaning a rock. He was uh, initially a follower of John the Baptist. Peter was the brother of another disciple named Andrew. And they were fishermen whom Jesus called to be fishers of men, fishers of women. And Peter was, did you know this? Married, according to Scripture. Matthew 8, 14 says, when Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law in bed with a fever. And, uh, and immediately that tells us something. We're putting the rest between the lines. We're getting a sense of who Peter is. In 1 Corinthians 9, 5, the Bible says, don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us as do other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? And over and over again, Peter is singled out. He was the spokesman for the rest of the group. Are you getting a sense of who he is? He was the first to act. He was impetuous. He was bold. And he could tie, at times be inconsistent. He declares that he is willing to go to prison and even willing to die for Jesus. It's a bold declaration from him. And yet we see that Peter denies Jesus three times before others only to be restored by Jesus. And remember that when Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says he does. And he, Jesus asks him again after he had already denied Jesus three times. And Jesus says again to him after he's resurrected from the dead, he says, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know that I love you. Peter, do you love me? And it was, I imagine a very... A uh, frustrating thing for Peter to have to be asked three times. Why would you ask me over and over? I've given you the response. I love you. But it is believed that Jesus with each moment three times was canceling out those three times that Peter had denied him. So that Peter wasn't Peter the denier. Peter was the one who loved him and was healed from the things of his past. I want to talk to that for just a moment with you. But let's look at Acts in the 10th chapter in the 34th and 35th verses. We see that Peter preached only to the Jews. Only to the Jews. That would leave almost everybody in this room out. Listen to this. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. So what is Peter saying right there? Do you know that the apostle Paul, who's an apostle out of time, didn't walk with Jesus, hadn't seen Jesus before his experience uh, on the road to Damascus, but he's considered an apostle out of time. So what we have is the apostle Paul says to Peter a very bold direct, uh, uh, declarative statement. And Paul is saying to Peter, don't you dare say to these that are Gentiles that they can't know Jesus, that the cross was not for them. 
Instead, let them receive what Jesus did on the cross and don't add to it circumcision and do not add to it rituals and different ways that you eat and clean food. All of that was in the Old Testament. It was there for a purpose, but we're in a day of grace. And he declared these things to Peter, who was the leader of the disciples. Imagine the boldness of Paul. But if it were not for the boldness of Paul, we wouldn't know what it is to be able to say we're part of the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're part of the faith of these greats that we read about in the Old Testament because we have received the same thing that we received that Jesus died on the cross for us. And we can know God personally because of it. And he rose from the dead. So in conclusion, when we think of Peter, what do we think of? Just think for a moment, Peter, what do you think of? We think of him walking on the water. That was pretty miraculous. We think of him declaring, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, when others were trying to say Jesus was something else, someone else. And he declared, no, you're the Christ. And Peter knew it because of the spirit of God. It meant he was sensitive that God had spoken that to him, no one else. And he declared it. We know Peter was on the Mount of Transfiguration as part of the three that were there of the disciples. We know that he protests as Jesus goes to wash his feet and yet receives the washing of the feet because Jesus is intent on doing so. He draws the sword and he cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest in the Garden of Gethsemane. And by the way, we were in the Garden of Gethsemane on our last trip to Israel. And uh, we loved being able to walk through the Garden of Gethsemane and think back to that moment when Jesus was struggling over the cup that was given to him. But he drank it and not just part of it, but all of it so that he might be our savior and our hope. And we know that he drew the sword, Peter did, and cut off the ear, trying to do something by his own strength that he thought was right. And Jesus healed the ear We know that he denied Jesus three times. We know that he preached at Pentecost with great power. We also went to the steps of where all that happened at Pentecost happened. We're going to be going back in November, as was mentioned last Sunday. We're going to get our brochures soon, so don't ask any questions. But set aside, I think it's the 3rd through the 11th. And set aside in November if you would like to come with us. And it's going to be a great group of people I know. And we're going to walk where Jesus walked. And it's something I look forward to in 2023. Acts 2.41 says, Those who accepted Peter's message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Peter's past failures did not disqualify him. Neither do yours. Rise to your feet for just a moment. I want to pray over you. It's possible to rise above our weakest and most difficult moments. Peter would speak of the great mercy of God. Capture that. It was a theme of his. He loved to talk about the mercy of God. Why? Because he had experienced that mercy. And it's the same mercy that's offered to you right now. If you have something that you look back on and it hurt you or you have shame attached to it or it was something you had no control over but it discourages you, I want you to be set free. Would you like to be set free? Would you like to walk out of here whole and complete? Would you like to see that in the, in the life of a family member, someone that you care about? We want to pray for that as well. Heavenly Father, as we bow our heads before you, God, we consider that Peter, according to tradition, was crucified upside down during the reign of Nero. He was fully used by you, fully committed to you. His story speaks to us again today. He was in the inner circle of your son. He was your son's close friend to be there, to confide in. And now, God, we pray that we, like Peter, will step out when no one else is willing to step out, to step out on the water to exercise our faith, to have holy boldness, to declare Jesus is the Christ. God, restore people in this room right now, I pray in Jesus' name. There's an anointing on the testimony of Peter. I wish that he would be here to say it instead of me. 
there's an anointing on his testimony to tell you right now, in this moment, you can be restored. And what has been holding you back and what the enemy thought he had you in and identified you with, right now, in the name of Jesus, we break every bondage in Jesus' name. Every anchor, every chain, abuses, shame, guilt, be gone in Jesus' name. If you receive that, just put your hand over your heart right now. God, we pray that you will raise up leaders in this room. Just like Peter was the one that led, God, what was happening on the day of Pentecost, cause us to be bold for you. Take away every fear in regard to being someone who's fully committed to you in this generation.